All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Strong. I'm the co-owner and director of Racing Magpie. On behalf of our entire team and community, I wanna welcome everyone to um, this exciting panel um, that's part of our new program called Winter Camp with Racing Magpie. Uh, and on this one, we'll have uh, some amazing art Lakota artists uh, presenting their thoughts about their artwork in the uh, Creation Story exhibition. Um, at Racing Magpie, we're dedicated to elevating and amplifying Native and other artists in their communities through educational, cultural, and research programs, all in the Lakota spirit of being a good relative. Uh, as part of that being a good relative, this program will reimagine the Lakota winter camp model of problem solving and community building in today's world by examining the deeper why, uh, the, the, the why around the way Lakota people do things and how they interact with the universe around them the way they do. While uh, these events are open to the public, they will always center and uplift Lakota community members first and foremost, as both presenters and attendees. Uh, as plants and trees focus their energy on building strength and growing from the roots during winter, our community will join together to strengthen and grow each year through sharing and learning. Uh, part of my job is to thank our sponsors for their generous support. I want to thank the South Dakota Humanities Council, which is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, the Bush Foundation, and uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities with a direct grant as well. Also, we've been asked how our supporters can contribute to our work. Uh, I would suggest like two ways in these times of virtual working and community care that you could do that. Number one, you can make a donation directly to Magpie Creative which is our nonprofit partner in our work. Uh, you can donate through their Facebook page or by mailing in a donation. The other is to support native artists and makers and creatives by searching them out directly and buying art from them, download their music, buy gifts for yourself, self-care and, uh, and for others directly to and from the artists. Um, Venmo and PayPal are also um, everybody's friend. Uh, some quick housekeeping. We want everyone to be really comfortable. This is a, an um, informal discussion by these amazing artists about their, their work in this exhibit. And um, we're live streaming to Facebook. So if you're watching us on Facebook, please type in your questions. I'll, in, I'll uh, jump in here and there and ask the questions for you. And then the artists can uh, answer as well. So um, I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to Keith Braveheart to introduce everyone else. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you, Peter. Um, thank you again, Peter, for um, and to Mary and to Racing Magpie for allowing us to um, be a part of the winter camp event and to help share our, our upcoming creation story exhibition. This is really the first um, preview of this exhibition, which will open this winter. Um, it was supposed to open this past December, but it has been um, postponed till this year. So it's upcoming. It hasn't yet been um, opened just yet to audiences. And so everybody who's tuning in today will get a nice sneak peek at what's to come. And it's really exciting. And beyond that, it's um, really, really grounded in, in this really like um, beautiful collective energy uh, of what it means to be a relative, whether you're Lakota or Dakota, but also how we're extending our, our concepts of relationship further into viewing our, our, our supreme relatives, um, which will be featured as uh, the content that this uh, exhibition is really about. So I'm really happy and excited as well here today to just be here uh, to hear these artists talk because I, I'm a big fan of them, but I'm also, um, a person who I think just really appreciates what they do, whether it's artwork or just being themselves. And that's a, a lot of what um, kind of led me to um, working with them on this project. Um, so we're gonna begin by kind of giving a little bit of context about the exhibition, just a little bit of the background, and then we'll transition into these artists really taking more of the, 
focus of this um, event to, to share their thoughts, to share their, um, their words, and to share time together as a um, panel as well too. So again, our, our exhibition is called Creation Story. And um, sorry guys, I have a quick little um, kind of, um, I guess, prospectus um, that I can provide. Creation Story is an art exhibition with cultural education programming that centers on the significance of creative expressions and oral traditions amongst Ochete Shakoni cultures. Multiple artists representing their Ochete Shakoni heritage provide visual artworks and creative concepts to engage audiences with the expansive creation narratives that underlie Ochete Shakoni identity and values. Creation Story presents the ancient spiritual entities and narrative figures culturally recognized as transcendent relatives and acknowledged as the central foundations for Ochete Shakoni beliefs and lifestyles. The goal of this exhibition and its cultural education programming is to encourage all audiences, especially those across our Ochete Shakoni communities to practice creative and critical modes of cultural continuums. So this exhibition is curated by myself, but also David Meyer at Okta Lakota Museum, which is in Chamberlain, South Dakota. And I also wanna give a, a special shout out to David who, who can't join us but um, who's also really involved in helping shape this uh, exhibition and who's really been a, a big part in, in really supporting its development and seeing it as a vision and, and coming into this with all of these artists and, and a lot of our um, viewpoints that are informed by our communities and our relatives at home as well too. And um, <clears throat> this exhibition, it, it focuses on certain, um, I would say relatives, but also characters, figures, uh, entities. And these are, are, are really um, known across discourse, but also they're, they're out there publicly, but they're also very uh, intimate and they still belong within our, our, our communities and in our, in our Teoshpae systems and even our um, even more intimate circles within uh, culture and, and lifestyle. But these figures are, are the beginning point for how we're going to approach this exhibition and how I, as a curator, um, approach these artists. And, and a lot of it was conceptual in a way that I thought about these, um, these figures in my mind um, visually. And I have always been so um, interested in, and I, I really do appreciate and love these creation stories that exist in our culture that I always wanted to see these unfold in some sort of an art form. And so I, I began creating these works you know, by myself and eventually that led to this opportunity to have an exhibition and I wanted it to be inclusive. I wanted it to be able to, to have further dialogue, further um, relationship building. And that led me to, to the decision, the, the hard decision of who you know, should I um, approach because I really do um, value and cherish all of our artists across our, our region, especially our, our Ochete Shakoni artists. And I didn't want to make this seem like it was very um, <laughs> selective in a way, but it's hard, it's hard to, to, to consider all these different artists. But um, I went with my instinct and I really went with my intuition. And a lot of the artists that came to mind when I, when I thought of these entities, these Daku uh, Wankan, these relatives, um, I, I, I trusted that I was kind of being led into a direction to, um, to, to make these um, invitations to these artists to be a part of this exhibition. And I mean, I'll, I'll explain this more a little bit further when we get to a certain section, but today we have um, these artists who, I, who I'm gonna reference as relatives just to let, acknowledge them and let them know that I, I, I do cherish their time and I, I view them in that certain way. So. We have Lekshi John Golzen, Golzen Center. We have uh, Hunkashi Michaela Patton. And we have Lekshi Dwayne Wilcox. We also have Hunkashi Diani Whitehawk, but uh, she's not able to join us today. Uh, she she's sends her regards and she sends her support. And um, I'll, I'll provide a little bit of um, uh, introduction to her work. But um, th again, this is just beginning. So I'm sure there'll be more opportunities in the future where you will get to hear from for more of these artists as, as they um, take part in, in a lot of the programming that will um, develop around this exhibition. And I just wanna remind everybody that tomorrow there's a part two to this event and there will be four more artists that 
we can hear from as well too. And um, as you can see, um, you can see the the relatives that are that are um, the art source, the the source of inspiration for for these artists of what they've created. Um, and I'll allow them to, to to explain that a little bit further in their in their own words. Okay. So without kind of any further delay, let's begin. And in our first relative is going to be John Gozen Center. And I just will provide a little bit of um, kind of clarification about how we're viewing these images as a, as a slide show. Uh, there'll be a, a couple that are, are prior works. Each artist will just kind of um, see, uh, provide some example of, of what they've um, done in the past, what their, what their medium may be, and also kind of what their um, experiences might be with um, art. And then they will transition into their actual art piece that they created for creation story. So, um, Lakshi John, would you like to begin? Uh, uh, my name is the uh, Golden Center. Yeah, that was the name, my surname also, but it's the uh, Lakota name. I, uh, my mother had also given me too as well. So, but yeah, I uh, want to thank uh, Keith in particular for the invitation to be in the show. And also all of you that are here to uh, maybe learn a little bit more about uh, who we are and what it is that we've been uh, invited to do. Uh, myself, I'm very uh, honored uh, just from what Keith was saying, even kind of humbles me even a bit more <laughs> that he was led <laughs> to find us. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm very honored. Uh, uh, Keith asked us to uh, send in some images of our prior work. And these two pieces that you see on the screen here are uh, recent pieces made, uh, let's say uh, the pouch on the right side there that was made probably uh, less than two years ago. And the bracelet there was probably about three years old, but uh, I guess it's kind of a, a examples of, of a continuum I had started uh, uh, as a creative back in 1974. So I've been at this uh, metal work and engraving and jewelry and, you know, for, for a long time, but, uh, Anyway, it's, it's, it's been quite a journey, but uh, being in this show, I was asked to uh, do a piece to represent the concept of Ia. So that's kind of took me into a whole different realm, kind of into what I call a sculpture or so. But, but yeah, I, uh, I've been inspired by other Plains Indians in particular, I always like to mention a Pawnee silversmith who really inspired me to take up the craft of metalwork. Uh, and as I got into uh, doing metalwork, it really kind of dawned upon me about and started doing research about how the Lakota actually were doing uh, metalwork on the, also, you know, so, so that's really been my endeavor is like, I'm not really doing anything uh, other than the fact that I'm just uh, on that continuum, my ancestors have, uh, initiated in their creativity with new materials, you know, so I always viewed the things that we've done traditionally as more historically because in the present from a long time ago, we are still creating, but whatever we're creating, we're uh, securing and preserving our identity, you know, so, so you can see uh, on this bracelet is a big red stone and that that comes from uh, the Black Hills. So there's a, a great affinity to this agate that's found only here in South Dakota. And that's what I choose to uh, use in my, my uh, contemporary expressions of Lakota jewelry. You know, that agate has its beginnings in surfacing when the Black Hills were uplifting. So this has caused me to understand more of what I call the discipline of geology. And when I was asked to be part of this exhibition, you know, uh, we're gonna, my, I was asked to do something that really kind of profiles the first uh, creature or the thing in, 
in Lakota creation story was Ia, the rock. So, you know, all of this is just like really kind of just, I don't want to say fell on my lap, but it was just things that I was already um, thinking about, especially with the agates that came up and their, and their genesis being their, they're probably estimated to be like 500 billion years old, you know, so <laughs> anyway, but uh, uh, in that little pouch we had, let's go back to that pouch there too, that I had on the other screen there. That one there was something, you know, uh, I guess I could even say whimsical, but, you know, Lakota ladies, they do beadwork and they did beadwork on such pouches, you know, and, and myself, I'm not a bead worker, but I, I thought I'd do something different. So this profiles some of my hand engraving, but uh, it really uh, uh, kind of came upon me that I guess that that's something new, but it's also something old. <laughs> And I thought about our culture, how we created many uh, containers to carry things around because we were mobile uh, people that moved a lot. So this is a strike light bag that they used to carry or at one time carry the fire making tools, you know. So, the, the, so when I make these things, they really kind of take me to a place of who we are, where we've been, and, and yet we still keep uh, notions of our identity alive. So that's metalwork, that's German silver, all hand engraved. That's buffalo leather underneath. And there's an agate the button set up there that kind of provides us the latch on the pouch. And everything is sinusoan, all natural material, I could say. And then those dangles on the bottom there are, are buffalo dew claws and parts of buffalo hooves that I've uh, carved and so, you know, it, it, to me, to me, it's like, it's Lakota, that's, so anything I do create, I always kind of have a filter, I run things through, I think, when I make things, would my grandmother really know what I'm doing, you know, so those, those are the impetus about what, what I do, you know, uh, so if ever you want to visit my website, lakotajewelry.com, you'll see a lot of other, what I call contemporary Lakota expressions, and in metalwork and the use of this uh, Lakota agate, I call it right now, because it really is found in our homeland. And it has an association with the, you know, our own creation story of the Black Hills surfacing. And this is where our genesis as Lakota people happened in, in uh, uh, Wind Cave, Lakota. We, we came from the earth, you know. So there's just so many avenues and creations to uh, you know, think about when I'm when I'm working. So that that's why I I really come to this exhibition like ready, prepared, something to do that I can really, uh, you know, contribute something that actually uh, again secures our identity to the land as Lakota again. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, I was invited to be in this exhibition and. Uh, appreciate uh, being asked to think about doing the, the uh, something that profiles Ian, the first thing in creation. And like I said, in all my jewelry creations of, of recent times, I, I've been using the agate and I do go hunt agates in the Badlands. So in doing that, I see so many different rocks and such, you know, and, and Ian is the first thing in creation was rock. And then I came upon this agate, a big agate that I uh, had trimmed and seen the inside of, and, and it's right in the center of this piece. And that's the only thing that's really been technically achieved. I've, it's been cut with diamond saw and polished. But you can see this amorphic activity happening, which really, to me, really profiles the, the activity of the amorphous action that was happening when Ian became rock, you know. So uh, that, that's something I, I, I really, there's like, a, it's like an epiphany I had. What am I gonna do for this exhibition? And first thing I thought of, if I'm gonna be creating something about creation, I cannot have anything, I mean, I wanna use everything that comes from the natural world. And of course, rocks that I always see when I'm uh, hunting for agates. And so everything that I use come from my environment. And 
many times I go walking along Rapid Creek here in Rapid City, and I see these trees that have fallen. And anyway, I seen this tree where I was able to get a slab of it. And uh, so that's a real actual tree. And those are four colored rocks that I have on there, red, white, black, and yellow. On each quadrant is what they call a Fairburn agate, but I call them Lakota agates. And those kind of show that a morphic sense of water becoming rock, you know, because that's really how these agates were formed in water. So to me, each agate has a pattern that's so unique to itself. I mean, that's how that's how great the concept of Wakantunka is that there are four beings that that in the beginning made up the Wakantunka and Eon was one of them. So I wanted to honor the first four entities, which were uh, we, the sun, and Maka, the earth, and Shka, which was the sky. Those are the, the four things that made up the original concept of Wakantunka. You know, the, the, these are things I'm getting from and how I'm able to kind of show something about uh, what creation looks like from a Lakota point of view. And from all these things that happened, we were able to der derive icons for today. So you'll see that red medicine wheel. And well, there's a concept that we have about Wakantanka being yellow. So there's the yellow in the middle, you know. So uh, that was my contribution. Why don't you show one that the last picture on that it gives you a better idea of what it really looks like as a three-dimensional uh, piece. And of course, I have the uh, icons of there that are very important to us Lakota people, the Waukee and Buffalo, and the, the circle, the hoop, and the four directions. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, thank you again for everything that you've given to this exhibition. And for all the listeners, again, I want to kind of just um, bring up a little bit more of the background of what this exhibition is kind of using as its structure. It's these um, entities, these relatives that we we consider them as, um, but they're really these um, supernatural entities that that reference um, certain kind of powers. Some of them are celestial, some of them are earth, um, but in, in this case with John, his is the very first being that ever existed, and from that first being, others came from. And what was left was, was the rock. So some of this is, is actually out there documented in discourse and different references and resources. But what, what we're doing with this exhibition is encouraging our artists and our relatives to kind of empower their voice and their interpretation of how they want to uh, continue to tell these um, ohunkanka, these creation stories, these old ancient stories in their, in their way, in, in their um, dialogue, in their um, language, which is a visual language. But then we're also encouraging, you know, other creative concepts that might come into this exhibition that might look at different modes of curriculum development and how might we encourage our generations today and in the future to carry on in these um, stories and to and to look at how they might become fluent in different languages of how they tell these stories. So we're really, really thankful to have John here to, to bring his artwork into this uh, exhibition to begin with. And now, um, again, thank you, John. We're gonna transition to uh, Michaela Patton. Whenever you're ready, Michaela, go for it. Uh, ha, Michaela Patton, uh, I'm Machia Pie. Hello, relatives, my name is Michaela Patton. I'm Ogallala Lakota and Isleta Pueblo. I uh, wanted to mention that my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am, I, um, I am from Pine Ridge. I was born and I, I grew up in Pine Ridge. Uh, my family comes from the Calico, Cheyenne Creek and Pine Ridge communities. So I kind of grew up between all of those communities. Um, I'm currently based in Roswell, New Mexico, which is on the ancestral homelands of the uh, Mescalero Apache. Um, I attained a BFA uh, from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico in 2019. And I, my emphasis was in printmaking, but as a printmaker, uh, I do, my practice also includes papermaking 
uh, beadwork and other mixed media such as installation and um, a little bit of like 3D work. Uh, my work, uh, in my work, I focus on and it kind of explore the relationships between like land and memory and body and healing through my lens as a Lakota woman. Um, so my work is very like process based and uh, visceral. Um, so the work that is shown here um, on the left is a piece that I did uh, last year, I kind of did a small series of these small uh, handmade paper pieces that were um, embedded with uh, um, uh, plant medicines uh, and then and then beaded on to to kind of um, have like this like relationship between, um, I guess, like a, a natural uh, material or it looks kind of like organic and um, more of like a, a man-made material, I guess. Um, on the right is sort of the, the three-dimensional work that I've been doing with my handmade paper, um, which is, uh, um, I guess, resembling the parflesh box. And um, yeah, so the piece, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. The piece that I made for the Creation Story exhibition is titled All That She Carries, which, um, which you know, I depicted uh, or represented Maka, Mother Earth, and um, doing so in a parflesh, resembling a parflesh box. Um, for me, I found it important to sort of embody her in like a vessel form, uh, resembling again the parflesh box, which was originally made out of rawhide and used as like a traveling trunk um, among like my people and many plains tribes. You know, like vessels, containers are really important, um, like what John was mentioning um, with a lot of like tribes you know, they carry like their important traveling things in these. And I just wanted to depict Maka as this because she, you know, she carries, carries us. And um, so anyhow, the, the finished piece is made out of recycled paper and embedded plant medicines and held together with deer hide. Uh, and thinking about the piece, I found it most important that um, that all the nations that she carries are represented here. So the nation, all nations represented are, you know, human and non-human. And that means for us, our, our plant, insect and animal nations. Um, and so they are, again, they are represented here. Um, another important part of this piece that I really enjoyed doing was the laser etching and cutting. So I created like these windows um, so that you're able to see inside of the box um, to see what, you know, the things that if Maka was a parflesh or if Maka had a parflesh box, what would she have in it? Kind of that idea. And um, again, we're represented inside and you can't see in this image, but um, John had gifted me a, uh, a rock that I was able to place inside in the middle of the parflesh. And I find that piece like really important to my piece because our, our, you know, the relationship between Ia and Makar is they've become one. Um, and that's all I want to say about that. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. And um, I mean, I'm really thankful for all you artists. And when we were thinking about um, approaching artists, one thing that was important to me was to consider, well, who's gonna carry these um, stories forward? Who's gonna, how are we gonna truly practice this continuum of, if that's what we're embracing with this effort? And it was important that we, we consider these artists who, who I would say, we can say are emerging, but really we're recognizing the greatness there already and we're wanting to nourish that. 
and, and a lot of the, the concept behind the exhibition itself too, was not only just to invite artists and their, their, their mastery of their medium and have their objects um, put on exhibit, but really to engage them with one another and to see what kind of um, unpredictability, what kind of organic um, elements might form from that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really um, so amazed by what took place in, in this period of time when you guys were all creating your work. And you talked about it just now, Michaela, with the conversation that took place between you and John and the understanding that, that was given above the importance of remembering that Ia and Maka are, are related in a way as well too. And those are, are really detailed in these um, different versions of the creation story, but you guys are also reinforcing that through your visual artworks. And, and I think that um, that's one of the, the things to really truly look forward to to all of you um, audience members who are gonna um, come see this exhibition is that uh, Michaela's piece is gonna be installed and it's gonna have different elements to it. So we're giving a preview today. We don't wanna give away too much. We want you guys to actually come and see the show when it opens up. Um, but I think that it's nice to hear the artist's uh, intentions and to hear a lot of what they're putting into these works and to, to get a little bit of sense of just how much this is a lot more than just only again, a, an object, but really some sort of uh, synergy, some sort of collective energy that we've all put together. And I, I, I really, really <laughs> appreciate all of the detail that Michaela has given to her work. And there's more, um, believe me, um, everyone, there's a lot more that you're gonna see in this. This is just only one uh, window that's showing you a lot of what's a part of her artwork. Um, so you do have to come to see it in person. All right, so thank you, Michaela. All right, let's now move next to uh, Duane. And Duane, I think you have to unmute yourself, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I. Uh... I did, I forgot which pictures I even sent you. Uh, these were uh, images. I think the second image that you have is a picture of a uh, racing magpie, uh, the tower, I think, or maybe not. I don't know which ones I sent you, but this was from a past exhibit I did with uh, Dr. Howe. Uh, and uh, it's just an example of some of my uh, mixed media style of ledger drawings that I've done in the past. It's a little bit different work than I, than I guess what everybody used to see in me do. I think at the time, this was an inspiration for another piece that it, uh, that these two were hung together at the same place. I did a stick horse. I don't know if you have that one. Um, that was the, yeah, that, that one, that was uh, Ochete Shakowi uh, Horse Nation. Uh, that was a, really a cool exhibit. These are, uh, th these two pieces, the reason why I sent you these two pieces is uh, my studio down at Racing Magpie, I was down there for uh, five years. A lot of people may not know where that is. That's downtown, the old Abbey's Feed Building. And, uh, these were two of the first pieces that are created in that space that was down there. And it was just kind of a, a thing to send to you for this uh, Zoom meeting that uh, kind of, I guess some little bearing on history and stuff uh, from all the time that has passed and all the artists that came through that, that, uh, that facility, which was quite a few. Uh, it's uh, one of those things that, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I won't make another piece like that. That was a one-time thing. And uh, the inspiration, like I say, was from the, the, the picture of the little girls. At the, it was a, from a horse race they had in Pine Ridge during the uh, Oglala Sioux Nation. That they, it was a contest to race horses. So that I, I thought that was just really cute. I had some other pictures of these girls, but this is the one that I liked the, the best. And uh, I thought it was just important to show young people uh, still having that relationship with, uh, with staying strong, competing, still being buddies. You know, it's uh, because I guess I'm a recent grandfather of two 
granddaughters. So I have to uh, be more mindful of uh, their gender. <laughs> Me being an old guy, I can't, uh, I can't raise them the way I did my son. The, the piece that I did for uh, the, um, the Wakantanka is a, um, is a bonnet because um, Shka was the chief. And uh, all, all, a lot of people, all they know of this guy is uh, the um, how happy we the, and we, the sun and moon, uh, the moon and sun. And that's about all they see. They see a couple of clouds and uh, now and then Joaquin, some lightning. So there's representative little pieces when I was making this that I added into my own collective thought process. You know, these, every bonnet you see is not gonna be the same collective of concept that I put into it. Uh, the little dragonfly on the uh, side piece is, uh, represents the star people, uh, the uh, ermine on the, uh, on the on the uh, sides is the clouds where Wakia hides. Uh, so there's there's just relative representation to that, and the blue is the blood of uh, Ia, and uh, it's it's the uh, it's a lot of little uh, characteristics of the the whole creation story because. How do you represent something like the sky with a visual image? You know, I guess I could have used a piece of clear plexiglass in the Washichu world and signed it and said, "That's there you go, there's the sky." <laughs> but you know that there's a lot of uh, representation to it, and it was it was a a challenge to put this together. Uh, it was a challenge because I used paper as the feathers, and a lot of that's my original medium that I'd used for a long time. And a lot of uh, younger people don't know that back in my 1900s, there was still a lot of the, the actual, our leaders still alive that signed those treaties and a lot of newspaper articles uh, back at that time rep, uh, referred to those, those men that signed those original articles of treaty as uh, paper, uh, the guys that signed the paper. So they referred to them as paper chiefs. Not that, that they were weak, but that they signed the, some of the original treaty. So after I read that article, that's the thing that, the thing that it kind of inspired. Uh, this isn't the first paper bonnet that I did. There's another one at Red Cloud. And that was really, uh, that came to me from that uh, article that I read. It was a newspaper out of Nebraska from the uh, like 1912 or 13. And uh, that was the first time I heard about it, you know? So I just thought it was just uh, kind of cool to pass that along about some of the historical terminology that the, the other side used. So uh, other than that, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a piece that I done that I'm really proud of. And uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be hard for you to hang, I know that but that is a really nice picture of it. When you had the screen up before, I had a picture of me ha ha with it on, and I don't know how you got that because I never, <laughs> I never sent that to anybody. How did you get that? That, that is just strange. Uh, yeah, uh, I was walking around the house because I have this refrigerator magnet that says, I'm the chief of this village. <laughs> so there I am trying to, well, I was trying to get see if it actually would, uh, you know, actually fit and actually, yeah, uh, you know, somebody could actually put it on without breaking it. <laughs> but uh, that was one difficult creature to create. Uh, that um, it probably weighs about seven pounds. A lot of people don't think that it's, you know, it's just paper, but that paper and everything, uh, and it isn't even completed con totally in this image. Uh, it still had needed a lot of work yet uh, to make it hang. I wanted it to hang free from everything because it's gone, the sky. I wanted it to be surrounded by 
uh, by nothing but air. So that's that's why I uh, had a difficult time to make it hang, so it wouldn't hang sideways. There's there's just all this bad science of uh, creating something that you don't know how you're going to display it. Though in your mind, you have a collective eye concept of what you want to do with it, but. It was a difficult piece to actually come together and uh, put it up. I think I used, um, oh God, what is it? Uh, casting material uh, on the inside to weight it so it would hang straight when you when you did put it up. And I think I used fishing line. So uh, hopefully when the, uh, the event opens up, it ain't too messed up. Um, uh, other than that, that I, you know, that's about all I got to say about it. Again, thank you um, very much, Duane. And um, I mean, this is amazing. This is, and, and I, I'm speaking to your piece, but um, I, I've always really looked up to Duane, and this is a, a reason why I approached him is because he, when I first began my artistic career, he was one of the first artists that I ever encountered. I can remember exactly going to, uh, I think, uh, the gallery at USD and seeing their collection up. And I saw his piece and it was a ledger drawing. And, and maybe a lot of us are familiar with his ledger drawings, his contemporary ledger drawings. But when I saw it, I was really inspired. And especially when I saw his name and then his tribal affiliation, because I, um, I, I recognized that as being a relative from back home. And um, throughout my, my journey and my, my years, I've always continued to look up to, to Duane. And every time I get an opportunity to visit with him at Northern Plains Indian Art Market or any other um, art act, uh, event, um, I'm always really delighted to, to just hear from him. And, and I know he, he's a person who, who carries a lot of knowledge with him as well too. And he shares that in uh, whatever he does and especially his art. So I felt like when, when thinking of the concept of shka, takun shka shka, this kind of um, authority amongst the Wankantanka, um, it was it was kind of like I had to consider Dwayne. And again, it's hard to make those decisions on, on all so many other artists who I also respect and, and look up to as well too. But I felt like Dwayne was the one, and especially when we're, when we're considering something um, very elaborate, such as his uh, headdress that he's making here out of ledger paper. And then with him having to do science and figure out the um, how's he going to make this hang and suspend from the air? Because again, this is just giving you an example of how it's going to look exhibited, but it's going to be sitting here suspended in air as if it is part of that movement and it is part of shka, or it's being adorned by shka. So something to look forward to and how we're going to have that in an actual exhibit space. But again, sorry, Duane, um, um, <laughs> I just wanted to show these pictures because it shows the full... Um, practicality of your artwork as well too, which is really, really incredible as well. So thank you, Duane, I'm really great. Um, okay, so we don't have um, Diani Whitehawk with us today, um, but I wanna talk briefly about her involvement and also share with you her piece, um, a, a preview of her piece. Um, but Diani is very well known. Uh, she's, she's really succeeding uh, professionally within all of the, um, spheres of art, not just only within native art, but she's transcending into this contemporary realm of being an artist. And she's she's really accomplishing great things. And, and we're all very proud of her. Uh, she's a relative from the Sichangu Lakota Oyate. Um, but I also know her from going to school with her at the Institute of American Indian Arts back when we were, we were young. Um, and ever since then, I've always kind of looked up to her work as well, too, because I keep seeing how it um, is pushing contemporary boundaries and, and how she can be a, a, a figure that really a lot of us artists, especially those who are kind of coming after her, can look to her and, and, and she's also going to share that time and resource with how they can be successful as well too. So she gives a lot of herself and she's, she's very much a humble relative and for those reasons, um, I, I really considered her and I know that she has a, a very busy schedule, so it's hard for her to agree to certain um, obligations. But I felt like um, it was important that we extend an invitation to her in consideration of the next entity or relative, which is Wokpe, the falling star woman. 
this mediator between the 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 um Wankantanka, these these transcendent relatives, but also the ancient um, ancestors that we would have. And, and I feel like she's doing that contemporarily. She's she's navigating between these different uh, cultural spheres and she's also really always activating a really strong, powerful voice um, visually, but also vocally. Um, so here's a couple examples of her work. Um, her work ranges from uh, two dimensional painting, but also now into this mixed media, which really relies on her um, I guess, appreciation for traditional art forms such as beadwork and quill work. Um, and then how does she bring this uh, very, very uh, contemporary aesthetic to that type of work? You can see her in her, in her um, a shot of her studio and I'm just always really, really um, <laughs> amazed by how much she takes on. That's, a, that's an incredible amount of work and she's, she really shows this fortitude, this diligence to her, her practice and she's always staying you know, committed to, to her life as an artist. So her piece that she's created for this exhibition, uh, it, it represents Wokbe, the falling star woman. And it's done in this two dimensional medium of painting, but you can see the references to some of the other concepts that she's been working with that um, relate back to these um, aesthetics that are, are more grounded in the, the traditional practices of quill work, uh, but also this abstract nature to it as well too. And I won't try to uh, interpret the statement of what this piece is and how she um, was inspired to create it. I'll allow her to do that when she when she gets the opportunity to, but you can get a visual uh, curiosity of, of just looking at you know what's here in front of us. And a lot of these pieces, you're gonna start to see that there's a lot of um, kind of um, subconscious collaboration. Certain elements are carrying over from work to work to work. And it's really showing or demonstrating that there is this relationship, even amongst our Wakantanka, our greatest relatives that, that exist and, and really lay the foundation for all of us, but also today as these artists are starting to be inspired by one another as well too. Um, and, and I didn't, again, um, Diani sends her regards. She wishes she could be here with us, but um, we do look forward to actually um, um, hearing, her, hearing from her again. So that's kind of, a preview of four of these artists and their work. Uh, again, like I said, tomorrow you'll, you'll see another four um, and you'll hear more about their pieces. I just wanna kind of conclude this first section of this event by giving a little bit of a tentative schedule so that you can see where this exhibition is going to actually be available at. It's gonna open at the Okta Lakota Museum in Chamberlain, South Dakota. Our um, opening date will be in December and it's gonna run until May. Um, we do have a few dates now that are, are starting to be confirmed as we've decided to make this a traveling exhibition. And with that comes a new concept of how we imagine this as a traveling exhibition. Uh, the first uh, confirmed venue are our relatives at the Heritage Center at Red Cloud Indian School, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. They're gonna take this exhibition on for fall of 2022. The other confirmed exhibition will, will be in 2024, and those are the relatives at the Britain Museum in Bighorn, Wyoming. There's two more um, uh, venues that we're still um, organizing, but we only intend to have this available for four other venues um, in addition to the Okta Lakota Museum. And with that, it's going to share more of this creation story and, and, and invite more artists to participate and, and also create new artworks that are gonna be exclusively at these venues. So a lot of that information will be announced in, in, in the months and years to come, but um, there is gonna more artists that are gonna be involved. Uh, eight, exactly, more artists that are yet to, to be welcomed into this exhibition. But also hopefully we look forward to like other programming that might extend beyond just the artworks that are on exhibit, that we can think about other creative ways to um, further community engagement or really get the artist involved. Um, so a lot of really exciting things yet to come. I think at this point now we can um, take questions from the audience and I really do encourage that the audience share some questions. So um, please, Peter, um, do you have any questions? So far we have um, some comments. We don't have questions. We have, uh, and if it's all right, I'll read those out so you all can hear. We've got a lot of gratitude and appreciation um, we've got my beautiful and talented daughter, Michaela. Awesome presentation. Um, we have 
I'm glad you're using original materials. Thank you for education and culture. Uh, Linda says, fascinating, grateful for the artists and for the insight and cultural references. Um, Angela says, as a Dakota descendant who grew up being culturally alienated, I appreciate the teachings being shared by the artists. And then Cindy says, the ledger art is so great to learn about the ways it is moving forward and how it began. I'm so proud. So far, that's all we have, but I really encourage everyone to, to throw their questions in there and I'll jump in with them as we go. Okay, I think I um, speak for uh, everyone when we say thank you for those comments. Um, and then I guess now we can just move right into the, the panel or some discussion dialogue. Uh, we can hear from the artists and we can allow them to uh, kind of, um, I guess, respond to one another. So um, artists- Keith, Keith um, before you go on, I did have a couple questions pop up if I can interrupt you. Yeah, sure, 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 yep. Everyone was typing while I was reading. So we've got- Yes, to please. Uh, this question's from Cynthia to Michaela. Michaela, what natural materials do you use in creating your paper? The materials I kind of embed into my paper are plant um, um, medicines such as um, sage, uh, sweet grass, uh, sometimes sometimes to, uh, tobacco and a little bit of dirt, uh, just like stuff that is sort of just around me. I just kind of throw it in there and it, it sometimes it's like it's in there where you can't really see it and other times it kind of surfaces a little in the paper and it's kind of cool. Thank you. Um, let's see. Destiny Big Crow asks, what inspired you all to do an exhibit based off of the creation story? I'll let the artist respond. What inspired <laughs> you guys? Well, for me, Keith inspired me. <laughs> inspired me to you know, and, get, and gave me like the opportunity and resources to, to learn, you know, about our creation story. Um, Cause through my work, I mean, I didn't grow up really culturally educated, but I, I'm learning as an artist, which is I think a really great opportunity for me. And um, I'm able to learn that and put it in my work and share that, so. I thank Keith for that opportunity. So uh, this is John here. Um, I think when uh, this this uh, opportunity, I call it, but also the invitation, uh, not to say again that it fell in my lap, but you know. Um, uh, the work that I had started many years ago when I was younger, but how it evolved came to this point about, you know, uh, identity as Lakota, but, but the rocks in themselves, you know, uh, through all of our ceremonies I've been to always, always uh, any ceremony was the prerequisite of having a, an Inipi. Uh, they call it sweat lodge, but we call it Inipi, which is, kind of, kind of, uh, what I call a, a recreation of creation itself when we start heating up the rocks and what comes off the rocks is the uh, breath of life, which is the steam and, you know, all, all of that, you know, of course, you know, as Lakotas, we live that creation story, you know, again, you know, and we're, we're, uh, have a great belief in, in the rocks and themselves as healers. You know, so you start you start from that point of the reality of your of being a Lakota, but you kind of uh, go backwards to understand that this all came from somewhere. You know, so hearing hearing and knowing about our creation story 
it's always unfolding in front of us. And it just is, it just isn't always written down on in a book, you know. We've been living as Lakota as a creation story every day, you know. So as a creative, uh, the material we use come from the earth, you know, or somewhere. So there's always that thought process. But maybe we never all got to articulate it because here we have a exhibition where all the creative people that are that have endeavored to live their life that way are bringing it out in different forms, you know. So we get to see the creation story from individuals. We get to see it in 3D. Uh, it will used to be at an oral story at one time, but but when you look at our ancestors' uh, material <clears throat> and their designs in particular, their colors, all of that, you know, is is telling that same story over and over, you know. So when I kind of moved into understanding uh, <clears throat> the uses of the rocks in my homeland, you know, that was really an enforcement to me to actually uh, talk about it when I started using agates in my jewelry. Is, is, is they're like individual talisman for us to remind us of our connections and especially the creation in itself, you know, so it brings us closer to a, a reality that's not really abstract, you know, so, so that's what my, my, my work always kind of entailed. So when I thought about making something as visual, but also uh, tangible, so this is where I used everything that was in my environment, you know, and they represent, you know, the water, the tree comes, was, was growing right by the water, the rapid creek, and all these agates are right out here in the Badlands and the Black Hills, uh, you know, and even the earth paints, uh, everything like that, you know, and, and, and that's the only way I could think of, of, of telling my story, you know, is just by uh, using those things around me. So teasingly, I always said to somebody, uh, anything I used like that didn't come from Hobby Lobby. <laughs> it's all here. This is what our ancestors use. They use everything in their environment, you know. So, so that kind of is the concept behind what I, what I've always tried to do. But here comes a, an opportunity to really talk about it even more so. And so, as as Keith uh, mentioned, this is going to go on to other artists, you know, and that's going to really kind of proliferate more of all of our concepts of of creation in different uh, art forms you know it's a tremendous story you know to me uh this really proves our connection and our love and our spirituality you know it's it's much more of a dynamic story that is believable rather than another abstract story about you know a deity that created everything and rested on the seventh day you know creation is still going on you know, we see that in the sky, the walk-ins, the, the weather, all of that. It, it, it's still, it's still being created. And then, when I see the uh, the Hubble uh, microscope, uh, that's what reminded me of uh, the just the artwork we've seen by all the stars. You know, <laughs> so we're, we're we're seeing creation out there too, in different forms and color and. You know, so 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 it's tangible, it's real, and and we as Lakotas are are, are bringing that back to a reality rather than an abstract form. And, you know, so but I, I was really inspired to, to do this. It really kind of gave me power, I would say, to understand who I am and what I have to share with uh, my grandsons. You know, <laughs> yeah, so. But I, I do want to thank all the other artists, which you guys have talked about and shown. That's really great. It's just really made me feel good about, about how there's so many dimensions to tell this cultural story and how it's really embedded in all of our cultural material. Yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs>
and Michaela. Oh, a lot of what Michaela and, and John said, you know, it's kind of like ditto. That's, uh, you know, being asked to uh, help another person from our Oyate is like, uh, you, you, don't, you don't say no, it's, uh, it's not like he obadi do to, <laughs> to come, you know, it's, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a selection process because he has to ask you, you know, has to conceive the concept of who, who he's going to bring into this, this, uh, this exhibit. Uh, and you, it's just something that's, um, it's humbling to be asked. So it, it's kind of exciting because it's, it's new. It's outside your, your comfort zone, I guess. That's, that's all I have to say about that. Thanks, Dwayne. And, and I, I can also respond too. is like, like I said, I, I, I heard these stories when I was a youth. I also got reintroduced to them later on as a scholar, as a student. And I was always, you know, fascinated. I, I, I loved them. I always could see the epic uh, cinema, cinematic nature of, of the story uh, in my mind. And I always wanted to um, bring that into my reality. I wanted some sort of visual in front of me. And I would make that just for my own, you know, I guess, satisfaction. And I always told myself that if I ever had an opportunity to do that, that I would take that. And I always imagined these as these big grand paintings in my mind. So when I had the opportunity to go to graduate school and to focus on, on some time to create work, I did that. And I created these paintings that were these eight relatives. And that was kind of the structure that we're using for this exhibition. There was this kind of um, split in how I was representing these Wakan relatives as, as being personified. And I was influenced by the different resources that I encountered, not just only my own, uh, I guess, cultural citations, but also, you know, the work that James Walker had left and a lot of that um, work that kind of influenced the generations that would come after his um, work here on Pine Ridge Reservation. But I was also really critical and I also wanted to en encourage our relatives to consider their voice as just as authoritative as any other um, when it comes to this. But um, again, it was just something that I wanted to see. And so it um, happened that it would be presented where we could have an exhibition. And I automatically thought of my relatives. I thought of how could I involve others and not just only my own work. And I, again, it's hard. It's, very difficult to be selective and to pick only a few because we want to have everybody be a part of this and hopefully it could unfold into something like that um, at some point but right now just to, to make things you know move forward we had to do what we could do and that was me reaching out to eight artists and even then it was it was kind of like I had to work in collaboration with the the venue Akta Lakota Museum to see if that was okay with them as well too so they became to a compromise where yeah we could work with these artists and then how do we go about that? So it's all orga organic. We, and we didn't really set out to have this big vision of an exhibition. It just became that. And I think that it's gonna continue to, to take place. Like John was just saying, creation's continuing. It's always still taking shape. And we as artists, we, I think we know that um, and we trust that. And so we wanna try to um, you know, stop and try to like um, really embrace and, and recognize those moments when they do happen. And so that's really what we're doing with this exhibition. And, and I just look forward you know, I never imagined when I was doing my own, my own pieces that they would ever, you know, manifest into the works that we see from Michaela, John, Duane, and all the other artists either. Um, so that's really the, the most beautiful part of creation to me is the unpredictability. And I, I know that we have so much more to look forward to as well too. So thank you for that question. Peter, do you have any more questions? Yeah, we've got a lot of great questions. Um, someone, um, wanted to lift up that comment that you just mentioned, that phrase that John mentioned and said, I like that line, creation is ongoing. And they said that they'll use that line in the future. Um, and then there was a question uh, from Charles where he asks, how do the creators, how do you artists use the stories outside of the event? I think you all alluded to it in some way, but um, I wanted to share that question with you all as well. Hi. 
I think John covered that. Uh, I think Charles probably asked that question before John was finished with his uh, comment. Uh, I think he covered that pretty good. Okay. Um, Dustin was asking uh, specifically to John, do you know anything about the Lakota term wawate or its history that, and he's heard it used to describe the Lakota agate? Oh, Wotawe. Yeah, those are uh, special uh, talismans, I call them. Things that imbue a power to assist, heal, bring strength, inspire. The most famous one we heard of was what Crazy Horse wore. He wore a stone and things like that, you know. So Wotawe is a talisman of sorts. Most likely all of these things have been like associated with with the power of creation, which was in the rock, you know. You know especially myself, when I work with these agates and even when I find one, you can't believe the joy it takes to have fathomed how old these rocks are and you find one that's been laying out in the, Badlands for millions of years, you know, and here you come upon it and you see how beautiful it is. I'm going to show you one right here. I hope we can see it really well, but this is probably one of the most inspirational finds I've found. And I don't know how we would determine it, but I don't know if you can see this. Uh, if I look at it, if you look Close enough, you can see a face of a buffalo with his horn and his face, and he's kind of looking down. And even the rock in itself is a shape of a buffalo lying down looking, you know. So this comes from nature, and it, it, it's modeled itself in the shape of a buffalo with his, with his, with his eye, his, his nostrils, and his, his horn, you know. <laughs> you know, so I'm just saying, you know, I would call this, uh, you know, it's going to stay with me all my life now, you know, it's, uh, to me, it, uh, it has power, it, it's, it's, it's the shape of the buffalo, and in our creation story, as it goes on, um, it tells about the formation of Te, Te Oyate, you know, the, the buffalo, you know, so even the buffalo as we see it today is this manifestation of creation from all these different forms of power you know and how we as Lakota have aligned ourselves with with the buffalo in itself that you know it, it comes full circle that buffalo is is really a manifestation of the creator it provides everything for us as Lakota you know so I don't know there's just so many powerful things you can talk about when you start really looking at how um Things are constantly moving in flux. In fact, the formal name of my piece I had for the this uh, exhibition is called Shkanshka, which is really a kind of a word for things are moving or it's a continuum, you know. Because uh, even right now, as old as these rocks are, they're 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 moving, you know. Maybe we can't see it, but the whole world is always constantly moving. You know, so we're, we're, we're caught up in this energy. So Wotawe is kind of this, this uh, again, this, this power of something that you take on personally and you align yourself with. That's how I see it, you know. And as we believe, you know, uh, we have spirits. So, the, you know, and so everything in, in, in nature and creation has spirit and we're all part of it. It's all eternal, you know. See, you look out and see the stars, and they just go on. And there's no end to it, you know. <laughs> it kind of blows you away, you know. Thanks, John. Um, here's a question from Suzanne that I think maybe all of you can address. Suzanne says, "Really inspiring work and curatorial work. Can you talk about it?" Um, if you as a curator and the artist see the materials themselves having their own spirit or agency, it feels like artists get so close to their objects. 
do you feel an intimacy to the materials you use? Go ahead, Michaela, you want to start first? Uh, yeah, I think that just, um, you know, in my practice, I spend a lot of time uh, really, I spend a lot of time really feeling the material a lot. Um, and most of my time is spent with a lot of paper, whether it's already made paper, I spend a lot of time like looking and feeling the texture and then um, and then repurposing it, I spend a lot of time with my hands in the water with the pulp, like just, just feeling it all of the time. So I definitely have, um, I guess like a, a relationship with my material. And so sometimes I get a little overprotective of my work, but yeah, I mean, they definitely have like their own um, agency and it informs me and I'm able to um, learn from it. And um, yeah. How about you, Duane? Do you want to go next? Yeah, a lot of times the material I use is, uh, it's become, uh, I don't know, uh, it's, let's just put it this way, I don't throw it away. <laughs> and a lot of it is useless to, to uh, just about anybody. Here's a ledger book that, uh, that it's from the 1840s and uh, got a picture in it. Just, it's, I'm never probably going to fill this, but I'm never going to throw it away. Uh, the paper, it's bad paper. It's wood pulp paper, and it's already almost 200 years old. So it's, you know, the only purpose this has to anybody is me. <laughs> so that's the uh, paper is kind of a weird element for me because when I was growing up, um, the only paper we had to live it out in the country was the uh, the flower bags from commodities. That uh, I remember my mom getting mad at me because I'd take her sewing scissors and I would cut the ends off of the flower bags when they used them, and she didn't like us cutting paper with her her scissors. But uh, that was the uh, paper that I had when I was a kid, and. Uh, I never wanted to draw over the words. It was like, oh, a blank slate when you when you opened that paper up. But I would always roll them up because they had a kind of a natural, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a natural rounding effect. So I always rolled them up and I stashed them, you know. So uh, I wish I could find that old stash because uh, that's that was the first paper living out in the country. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't something that was readily available or we had money to buy any stuff like that. Thanks, Duane. John, you wanna? Well, in, in relating to, to material, you know, uh, I have to go back when I was a little boy, you know, <laughs> just like uh, Duane did, you know, with things that we were exposed to and used, but somehow I don't know exactly how the, it all happened, but anyway, through my grandmother, with her relationship with other relatives, I was presented with a, a, a dance regalia. <laughs> so I, 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 that was something that was really, uh, you see dancers out there, you know, then all of a sudden you, you get all that and you really get to know what it is that you're, you're wearing, you know, so having a bustle and beadwork and you know, Pesha and learning all of that, you know, but uh, pretty soon I got to uh, being creative and start modifying my, my outfit, you know, getting more feathers and, you know, switching them around and, you know, so, so that's where I came really cognizant of, of things that, 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 you know, became very dear to me. And, and even as a little boy, you know, I, uh, walking around, picking up sticks and rocks and 
particularly rocks. I know I had a, I, I had a box of agates when I was a little boy. Then I got sent to boarding school, and when I came back, all my rocks were gone. So anyway, but so I've always had those kind of uh, things that I related to, you know. I never had that many toys, you know. So uh, what toys I did had were, you know, were still in my memory because I didn't have that many. But but I remember though playing with uh, bone horses, you know, they come from the knuckle bones of cows, you know. So. So uh, it is all kinds of natural material that I didn't realize, you know, uh, but they were real. And somehow your imagination went into using those things to create something that was usable, beautiful, you could relate to it. So that that's kind of where I think a lot of things have started for me. But now now that I work with metal and, and, and agates and rocks, you know, and do lapidary work and cut and polish stones, Whenever I cut open an agate, it just it reveals a face to me that I guess, you know, I, I I see patterns and colors that are unimaginable that you could never have thought that you could see such things, you know. So, so that's a discovery all the time with material that I have. But like I said, the piece I put together for the, this exhibition was was really kind of what I've been learning all my life with things that were around me, you know. You know, I have, I put 28 rocks around in, in that, that sculpture I did. But I tell you what, that there's a whole badlands full of rocks out there. But for some reason, I couldn't find the right rocks. I mean, I, so it took me a long time to search for the right rocks for all of them. I, I don't know what it was that was driving me to, to find the right rocks. But, you know, it, it wasn't an easy thing to find 28 rocks, you know, four black, I mean, red, black, white, and yellow. <laughs> but that that put me on a search so is that you know this so and then i'm not like Dwayne. i throw nothing away i can have boxes of scrap metal and you know and, and it, it resides in my mind and sometimes i wake up in the middle of the night i'm thinking of all my inventory of stuff you know and it dawns on me i don't need to buy it that much i have it right here you know <laughs> not that i'm a pack rat I, I all that stuff is useful anything you know, so it's a different way of relating to material. It's just it's just every kind of way I would say. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll I'll respond as well too. Um, <clears throat> I think we're all like that, um, especially those that call themselves artists, but also just creatives. And I think that everybody has that kind of, you know, I guess essence to them. Is there something we won't throw away, right? We refuse to throw it away because we imagine that we're going to use it. We're resourceful, especially our, our tribal um, relatives. You know, we, we go back to our origins of how resourceful we were. I refuse to throw away um, the rings of my masking tape because I feel like for some reason I'm still going to use that. And I just got a bunch of them that just go with me every time I move somewhere new. Um, the, the same paper or something that's just tactile, like Ma Michaela was saying, there's something that might... Um, appeal to my sensation of touch when I touch something and I can already imagine what is this going to be as an artwork and I think that's one of the I guess the the gifts and the curse curses of being an artist because um you're always going to kind of like carry things that sometimes make more work for you but um we do it with the best intentions of creativity this pure urgency to just be expressive and we see that with youth as well too youth can recognize the world differently they're going to come to John John's piece and they're going to know what it took to go out there and find those special rocks. They're gonna understand that differently than the, the I guess, stereotypical exhibit goer. And then that's what we wanna see with these exhibitions is we wanna see them really make these connections that sometimes get overlooked or never maybe even considered. When it comes to the exhibition itself, I know these artists are all masters of their medium. And when I first approached them, I acknowledged that and I told them that I'm very, um, you know, aware of what they can do. And, and it could be anything. And if they contribute a small scale, you know, maybe took an hour to complete piece, it would still be as great as anything that took months and months. And it's, you know, huge. So I feel like what um, I was aware of from the beginning is that uh, they're going to put their, their all into it. They're going to put their heart and their spirit, and it's going to be informed by many different kind of, uh, I guess, communications and transferences of energy. And we know this because we see these things as artists. You know, we can see an artwork and it sometimes it doesn't have to be spoken about. There should be no statement. 
the artwork speaks for itself, right? Or we might go see a, a piece that we really love ourselves and it's almost like it's alive. I seen this with Oscar Howe's work when I first began as a two-dimensional artist, I can see his spiritual energy that he was putting into this artwork. And it really, um, I guess, resonated with me. So when I was thinking about this exhibition, a lot of the thought was that we don't wanna have this be something where it's just another artist and their, their great um, skill or there's their proficiencies of what they can do with their medium and materials, but really how can this all be uh, cohesive? How does it all relate to one another? And I think that it shows that. It shows that, that, that a lot of these work, like I said, have a subconscious almost collaboration. And it's really because these artists are almost on the same wavelength. A lot of them are kind of engaging with each other where normally we might not normally do that too often because we're separated by certain kind of boundaries within the parameters of art, especially native art, when we think about, well, what is it? Is it competitive? Is it merit-based? You know, it can really kind of be, uh, you know, a division. And so we're, we're kind of going over that and we're really getting the art to, to do what it's really about. It's the power source and it's connecting these larger circles. And I think people, when they come to the exhibition, they're most definitely going to see that. And I know that there's a lot of excellent exhibitions that are taking place and will take place that are doing that already. But we're just encouraging that more of that takes place. And especially from within our homelands, we want to see that our relatives can do that. And we want to encourage them to keep doing that as well, too. So thanks for that good question. Um, Peter, is there any more? Uh, not right now. A lot of a lot of comments of support and appreciation. And um, I think if you want to move on to your, your question that you had or your discussion topic. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you everybody for those um, excellent questions and thank you artists for, for responding to them with some great thoughts. Um, let's maybe begin a little bit of a discussion now. We're kind of approaching almost a, the last stretch of our event, but I wanted to propose to you all something to consider, maybe create a dialogue with, is just real general, um, what is this exhibition to you? And, and why do you feel like, um, or how would you encourage others to go see it? What, why would, should somebody go see a, this, our exhibition? And then whoever would like to go first, you can just jump in there. I'll go first. Uh, I think that th um, this exhibition, you know, like I was mentioning, you know, I didn't really know a lot about the our creation story and I was able to like really learn it and get into it and and know like the narrative um story about it because you know you presented it to me so I think that if somebody that's not really too aware of like the story um it's just a great opportunity to just learn it um through the visual works and and also learning it from the people, you know, like the, you know, us as like relatives of where the story comes from, learning it from us. And I just think that it's, it's like a really good opportunity. And for me, like the first time this is like happening too, like, so it's kind of like a, a big deal to be there and see it. <laughs> and you, you'll be able to like feel the energy from the work because we definitely all put our energy into these pieces and feeling it and then learning the story is just I don't know, really important. <laughs> uh, this is John here again. <laughs> uh, no, when I uh, was approached by Keith, I, I said, well, yeah, this, this is a, an interesting exhibition that, you know, yeah, uh, maybe even myself don't know everything about our creation story, but what I have tried to understand that it, 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 our creation story comes in various different uh, perspectives, you know, but it's all entailing because there's even diversity within our own Lakota culture, you know. So the, those stories, but there's a common thread to all that whole story, you know, which I which I uh, totally understand. 
but myself, you know, uh, maybe I'm the elder of all these artists, you know, but I, I've been exposed to all different uh, mediums of art. Uh, I have been inspired by uh, artists when I was a young boy. I fortunately, I was, you know, some of them are my relatives. I was, uh, Andrew Standing Soldier is one of them that came from our community in Heisel and that whole area. And then I had a uh, aunt that was intermarried into the Blackfoot tribe and, and that's another Plains Indian culture that I knew, which was the Blackfoot. That was Victor Pepion, you know, and of course, uh, Oscar Howe, uh, then just around Pine Ridge, I think of all those, uh, you know, they were they're, they're, they're culturalists in a way, they were just living the life of Lakotas, but they were doing paintings, you know. Uh, so we've, we've always been trying to express our, our uh, culture through through mediums but but I've been learning uh, a lot you know uh, throughout my lifetime you know I've served on the board at uh, several different art museums so I got to understand kind of a worldly perspective of art and the value systems behind all that but but moving into this new way of expressing our art sovereignty I would say telling our story from our perspective and our own uh, creativity, uh, our own history. Uh, it's not being curated by uh, uh, anybody that has a, a kind of a concept of anthropology about who we are, you know, we, we, we are much more than all that, you know, so. I just see new, new ways of uh, expressing ourselves in, in a freedom Way I, why I say that is because uh, I was uh, lived in a time where it was not good to be an Indian, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, our, our culture was suppressed back then, sort of at the boarding school. We never got to express ourselves creatively. Uh, we, were, we were kind of channeled to do something that was kind of far away from who we really were. Uh, but I really always remember the looking back as I was gaining maturity on what that really meant was the Religious Freedom Act, you know, <laughs> and also uh, the Self-Governance and Education Assistance Act. Those were things that were kind of benchmark uh, things that really opened us up in a sense because there were smart Indians that helped draft those laws, you know. So I always kind of look back on our own intelligence, you know, I know, so I so there, there's there's like a lot of hindsight I have, but 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 knowing that we gotta keep going forward, you know, with our own sovereignty, doing things our own way again. Maybe when I when I seen the uh, National Museum of the American Indian in concept when that opened up, everybody was critical of it because it wasn't run like a, a mainstream museum. It wasn't an anthropological museum. It was all done by community curators. So all of a sudden I was thinking, well, yeah, that's, we're telling our stories from our own uh, perspectives, you know, and it's sort of gaining validity now, you know, so we are in an era where another generation of Lakotas are free. Myself, I still feel constricted because the way I was raised, I still see things in kind of like a, a mix of his history and tradition. I know uh, uh, Keith and I have conversations sometimes with me, and he often would ask me questions that stimulates me, you know. So this this kind of an exhibition takes us out of the 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 kind of the, the uh, temporal theme of when, who are we as Lakotas? Our, our history goes back over 10,000 years ago, as opposed to our identity be, being in parallel with the United States history. Because <laughs> a lot of times we, people, uh, you know, we reference our history by the Battle of the Little Bighorn, but we were much more before that, you know. <laughs> 
So, so this is where I think we're, we're just taking a hold of our own uh, destiny, you know, and uh, recreating even our own culture again and taking it to a whole nother, another level. Because I see that by my own children who got to be Lakotas and to be free about it, you know. So they are contributing not only to Lakota culture, but to the world in itself, you know. So the, this has taken us into world citizenship, you know, beyond the United States boundaries. You know, that's the way I see it. We, we, are, uh, we are of the world. We're of the planet, you know. We're already, you know, uh, proliferated and intermarried over in Europe and stuff, you know, so. So we're on a we're on a trajectory of being uh, great people again. You know, I often wondered about you know they reference us just by the greatness of how we fought the federal government. You know, <laughs> but no, uh, we're 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 creative people. You know, that's the way I see it too. Yeah, but I'm always thinking about all those kind of things. You know, and, but I'm encouraged by the young artists. You know that are. In this exhibition, I am, I'm glad that as an elder artist, I'm in this, you know, so, but I'm still learning, you know, and I think that's the whole part about being a creative. And, and I think everybody is creative. And, and uh, so those that tuned in, you know, to watch this, I think they're just as creative to understand and learn and get inspired because that's how I operate, you know. I'm always inspired by other people's art. So that's why I like being an artist at this. <laughs> I, I think what it, um, for me just personally, I think uh, I don't know everything about the creation story. I learned a whole bunch just by reading uh, LaPointe's uh, paper, you know. Um, but here's the thing. It's more important to know more today than you knew yesterday because tomorrow you might need that. And I think that's what we got to take away with this is uh, – that information is being out, being let go out into the world, uh, and a, at a bigger, uh, at a bigger way, I guess. Uh, there's uh, just simply knowing more helps. I think the uh, ignorance causes a lot of uh, a lot of problems in our world, and uh, the more knowledge we could keep in our and our Nasula will be better off. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Thank you guys for, for those great thoughts and uh, just for how they can start to really inspire us and, and what more we can start to imagine, right? Um, and I guess we're, we're kind of getting closer to the, to the ending, but uh, I'll, I'll leave us with one more last prompt maybe that we can uh, discuss and then make room for any more questions of any audiences have any other questions but I, I just want to talk like um we, we've we've kind of discussed quite a few different things as far as how significant is this exhibition and our involvement with it you know what is it to us you know we've kind of focused um, primarily on the artworks that we've created but I also want to ask you guys what what other aspects of this um uh, effort do you see? Do you start to recognize? What else could we maybe um, let audiences be aware of that there's more to this than just only art? There's more to it than just the, the beautiful narrative. There's more to it than just these artists who whose names are are, are going to be seen. And um, is there anything else that you, you think we could add? Because like uh, John said greatly is that this is continuously being created. You know, what might be uh, something that this can grow into eventually. Maybe if it doesn't even happen in our um, exhibition run, maybe there's something else that takes place in the future. You kind of maybe talked a little bit about that, but I wonder if there's any thoughts that are really, you know, there that you guys might be able to bring forward. 
I think that one thing that was really like, I don't know, um, empowering or like mind blowing to me was that like how this story, this creation story is literally the, is literally like the, the making of, you know, our planet and this earth and this, and, and things beyond that. And, and that we know that through this story and that that was passed down and that it, although it, you know, reading about it, um, it's kind of like, again, this kind of like this story about kind of almost giving these characters, um, like these type of personalities, you know, how they reacted to when they were being created and how all, like this came from that. And I don't know, I just think that like, it's really amazing how we were able to talk about that in that way that, you know, we know as Lakota people, how we got here and um, just being able to appreciate the things around us, you know, whether it's the the air, the clouds, the sky, the and then beyond that, and you know where we come from, like where our physical selves come from, and then where our spirit comes from, and just I don't know, I just think that's really amazing about um, this this exhibition and just the creation story in general. So I think that that's another thing that's. Um, really amazing about um, this, you know, this project. And then thinking, and then like kind of what John and uh, was mentioning, you know, like we are able to tell the story from us, you know, we, we can tell the story instead of like outsiders telling our stories. And that's also really important about this exhibition. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, John here again. Um, yeah, no, uh, Michaela, thank you. Because that uh, what you mentioned about all the characters in the, our creation story, they had kind of like humanistic qualities because we as humans conceived all that phenomena into the way we related it. And, but to me, this kind of points to a greater movement that's happening today and it's called native science, you know, and, and that aligns with our, our, one of our Lakota philosophies of Mitako Oyasi and how everything's related, you know, because all these characters in our creation story had names and they had personalities. And somehow they're all related, they, they made relationships. And then we see in the world in that same uh, phenomena of being interrelated because uh, somehow we were all related because everything in creation we we exist with with oxygen and water and, you know <laughs> all the plants and animals you know the all these different nations that we call you know so we we, we see that and that's nothing abstract. That's reality, you know, and somehow we see the sacredness and all that. We understand uh, there's just much more than uh, one deity. It's it's everything in concert, and we look beyond this planet and see that there's other planets and stars being formed, and you know, so it's it's a it's something we just I don't know. There's happiness in all that to me to understand, you know. But I do know we have native scholars that are also uh, trying to articulate a, a worldview to the rest of the world about how interrelated uh, everything is in, in nature. You know, uh, it's, everything's complementary. The, the uh, you know, what we see and talk about in modern terms today in creation are called eco regions, you know, where all of us were formed and our societies and social systems and beliefs came from the resources within ecosystems. And, you know, so, so we see that, that we've been in alignment in an equilibrium with creation as it's been moving, 
you know, and we see that today too by, they call it climate change, you know, <laughs> and then we as native people have all have been undergoing climate change where we have a quality of adaptability because we move with things too, you know, so we're not static. A lot of times these people put up state boundaries, international boundaries, and they see the world in static terms and they develop laws of property and all that around that. But, you know, that's to us as native people, we've never lived that way, but, but somehow we have to know that to not let that inhibit our creativity and our, and our beliefs, you know, to say that, you know, uh, where we are totally a good relative with it all, all creation. In fact, that's one of the simple prayers that uh, one of our famous spiritual leaders, Black Elk said is uh, he wanted to be a good relative to all creation, you know, and that's equilibrium, that's a balance, woakwala, peace, you know. So I think that's what I always see in all these kind of things that we're doing as indigenous artists where we're portraying something that's not abstract, but a reality because that's really how this planet exists within the multiverse, you know. But I get very philosophical about all that, you know. But that's me, I've been learning all these years, you know, even to do this whole idea of creation stories enlightened me even more to see the path ahead for each generation to be Lakota, to take the Lakota way we are. We've had our evolution severely interrupted, so we're just regaining all that to go forward as the Lakota people should. Yeah, I like your tattoo. I see it on your arm. <laughs> Walk in. Yeah. Thank you, Michaela and John. How about you, Duane? You have some last thoughts to to leave us with? Yeah, it's it's always, I think as an artist, it's always seems to be we're uh, viewed as somebody that's trying to take credit for something. And uh, it's not really us taking credit for anything uh, that's, that we, that we manifest, I guess, create ourselves. Uh, we're, we're trying to, I guess we're, as we're enlightened, we want everyone else to be enlightened also. I think that is the pro that is where we're at because a lot of uh, times you get asked really uh, difficult questions. It's like, well, who appointed you to be, you know, the interpreter? Uh, that's that's hard, you know. It's uh, at at especially when you're still stay taking baby steps in the culture. Like John said, it's it's like. Uh, I remember, I ain't as old as John, but I remember boarding school days. Uh, it's uh, the reflection of who we were back then was basically muted. I mean, whenever you wanted to be something, you, you were muted. Uh, possibility to, for growth today is where we're at now. With this exhibit, we're able to uh, really move ahead far faster than than we did when we we're young i guess the woke generation uh woke us up uh, uh, if we tried to wake up back then they would knock you out so <laughs> that, that I, you know I, I hate to you know joke about it but you know it's it, it, there was some traumatic experiences that you 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 endured as a young person back then and, and I imagine it was even worse just that one generation before me uh, so there's privilege with this time that we live in and uh, we we have a scope now we have a direction to move forward and it's exciting and that's all I have to say yep thank you Duane that's that's great um, well, thank you all. Thank you all. I think that concludes our, our discussion and 
for this today's event. Peter, do you have any uh, questions that maybe we can respond to with the last remaining time we have? Well, uh, I just wanna express my gratitude and encourage the, the three or four of you to go look at the Facebook um, comments when you get a chance. There's a lot of affirmation of gratitude from others and appreciation. I do wanna add that um, there was a, one person who agreed with Dwayne's mom and said cutting paper with sewing scissors is a cardinal sin. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little uh, support there for your mom. And then um, I just, I'd like to close on a comment from Billy Janice. He just, he just offered I, that he's never attended an online viewing of our artist nation, but as an artist uh, himself sitting here working on his projects and listening, it's very humbling. He really appreciates the opportunity to let the world know of all the beautiful art Lakota people create for the world to see. It makes one feel very proud to be of indigenous descent. It's very compelling, inspiring, and motivating, especially for him being away from home at the moment. And, and I can't say it any better than Billy did. So um, much gratitude to, to all of you. And um, I know we'll be back tomorrow, Sunday at noon on Facebook Live again with four more artists. Keith, do you wanna close out with a comment or anything or um, should we wrap up? Um. I guess, sure, yeah. Uh, please join us tomorrow if you're able to, as we will we'll continue more conversation around Creation Story. You'll also get an opportunity to see uh, four new artworks from four new artists. And you can go to um, Racing Magpie's page to see those artists. Um, but again, I just wanna really express my thanks personally to, to you, Michaela, to you, John, to you, Duane, and Peter as well too, for supporting this and being a part of this. You know, you're a part of this Creation Story as well now too. Um, but I'm very thankful and, and I know that everybody um, is really going to look forward to the exhibition now. So thank you for helping to like preview that. And hopefully we can get a really great turnout when we um, start to show this exhibition at all these different venues. Okay, so I'll leave it open if you guys want to just all unmute yourselves. Maybe we can all just say a good doksha and good afternoon, stay warm, whatever you want to say. Doksha, okay. Doksha. Thank <laughs> you.